Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful once again for the opportunity that you've given us to just think about your word. I just ask that you would strip away all foolishness, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. In these videos, we've been studying together in the Epistle to the Romans, verse by verse. And in our last study together, we were in chapter 7. And I've sort of hovered over this, lingered here in this chapter, looking at the conflict that exists between the new man and the old man. I think it's an important chapter, not to say that it's any more important than any other, but we've come from God's wrath directed against man because he sinned in Adam, where he was declared a lawbreaker to there being none righteous and our being justified freely by his grace. Many marvelous truths we've traveled across to get to this, this point. Uh, justification it's not based on human merit because of the faithfulness and the obedience of Jesus Christ we saw that we were called by the faithfulness of God that he sought and he, re he redeemed his own people and we saw we looked at the marvelous truth that we have peace with God access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and if that wasn't enough, we saw that we were dead to sin, dead to the law. The result being that sin shall not have dominion over us. Yet, despite all of that, all of that marvelous, glorious truth, there's a conflict between the righteous new man and the old man. Yet we have victory. We've been assured that our victory is through Jesus Christ. It's difficult to cover all of the possible meanings that people have suggested regarding this chapter. And I don't want to really take the time to do that. Uh, there's been a lot of different interpretations that I've seen. And so it seems best to simply look at these verses. I'll tell you what I think they mean. And as I always pray, I, I, I trust the Holy Spirit will filter out all of the foolishness, uh, that which is ignorant and foolish, but seal to our hearts only that which is truth. I do not think that any man has a corner on truth. And so my ideas are only my ideas. The truth, folks, is this book. And we are to study diligently to make our election in our calling sure Romans 7 starting at verse 9 for I was alive without the law once but when the commandment came sin revived and I died says Paul or says the Holy Spirit through Paul I'd like to read a passage from Galatians that I believe coincides with what we are studying here. You might look at it, at it as a cross-reference, a parallel passage. Uh, this I, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other so that ye cannot do the things that you would but if ye be led of the spirit ye are not under the law and they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts that's Galatians chapter 5 now back to Romans 7, verses 9 through 12. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. 
for sin taking occasion by the commandment. Sin, not law, but sin, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Here in Romans, Paul says, with my mind, I serve the law of God, but with my flesh, the law of sin. Now, I'm simply going to take this as I think normal language would be taken. There was a time when Paul was alive, and I believe that to be when Christ made him alive, through his death, removing Adam's transgression, behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world, because Paul belonged to God. Paul was God's child. And when the law came into Paul's life as a new creation in Christ, not I'm not talking about as a Pharisee who had only thought that he was blameless by keeping the law. Sin revived, and he died. He died in his own sins. You have to take the word in context. Ye are dead, and, and your life is hid with Christ in God. It's hid with Christ in God. As it regards the matter of, of justification, regeneration, new birth, when you were dead, God quickened you in Christ. That's what the text says. Now stop and think about that for, for just a moment. Just take a moment out of your day to think about that. Nothing makes more sense than to say, God made alive that which is dead. Nothing. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. On the contrary, Nothing is more ridiculous than to suggest that a dead man made himself alive. That somehow the dead man raised himself to life. Modern Christianity says a dead man raises himself to life. He makes himself alive, alive by something that he or she does while in a state of death, while they're dead. But... Folks, your Bible says that God raises a man from the dead and gives him life. That life must come first before anything else. It precedes all else. And multitudes find that concept difficult to grasp. Why? As it regards the matter of, of our sanctification, our walk, our growth, I believe it is extremely important to realize the simple fact that if we believe a man who is dead does something to make himself alive to begin with, It can only lead in one direction. It can only lead to the further ridiculous notion that the old man, the flesh, can somehow be pleasing to God, and that by means of the law. In other words, a wrong view of justification leads to a wrong view of sanctification. Paul says, I was alive apart from the law, alive apart from the law. So the subject here is law. Paul was not apart from the law when he was a Pharisee of the, the Pharisees. We know that. We know that he died in Adam. We know that. How could he possibly be alive? He had to be alive in order, first of all, he had to be alive in order to die in Adam. If he hadn't been alive, he would have never died in Adam. And if he died in Adam, or I should say since he died in Adam, well, that's all it takes. 
to go to hell because death passed upon all men. But something happened when Christ died so that Paul could declare he was alive separate from the law. However, there came a time when the commandment came. The law entered his life. The commandment came as a new creation in Christ. Sin revived and he died. For by one man, sin entered the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men. Now that sin revived and I died. How, how could he have died if he had not been made alive? The scriptures say, ye are dead. In speaking to us, it says, ye are dead. The body is dead because of sin. You have to look at those passages of scripture and you have to take them in context. I mean, is your body dead or isn't it? The body is dead because of sin. Not, not dead physically. It's not talking about physical death. But dead to any law of God, to any responsibility to God, there is absolutely nothing the flesh can do to please God. Nothing. In the flesh dwells no good thing. There's nothing the flesh can do that is acceptable to God. God says, it's not acceptable to me. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. They are not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can they be. Therefore, the body is dead. Now Paul says, I died. The scriptures clearly say that there's an old man and a new man. The whole chapter is centered around that subject. The word clearly says that you've crucified the old man. He's got to be dead. Has to be. They that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. No wonder it says the body is dead. It better be, or you're not Christ's. It doesn't say if you're Christ's, you ought to crucify the flesh. That's 70, 80 percent, if not greater, of modern Christianity. A huge percentage of people say, you know, if you're Christ's, that's, well, that's what you ought to do. You ought to crucify the flesh. You ought to put the old man to death. You know, most of you aren't doing it, so let me try to help you. But that is not what the text says. It says, since you're Christ's, you have crucified the flesh. I believe that Paul, being alive, has to infer that Adam's condemnation had to have been removed by Christ. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Paul says he was alive apart from the law or separate from the law. So I, I cannot believe that this is speaking of his time, his experience as a Pharisee, a Pharisee of Pharisees, when he declares that as touching the law, he was blameless. That is to say, he, he thought everything the law had commanded of him that he had done it. I mean, it, it takes, I think it takes some conceit to do that. Maybe in his own mind, he thought he had done that, but you know, and I know, no one could do that. It is not possible for the flesh to fulfill the law. Impossible. But he did declare, as touching the law, he considered himself to be blameless. And so many have said, well, that's, that's what he means here, that, that he thought. Paul just thought that he was alive. You know, he really wasn't. 
but the text does not say I thought I was alive once. If it were that, it would seem to me that the Holy Spirit would have said, I thought I was alive when I was blameless as touching the law. But he doesn't say that. Doesn't say that. And he said when sin revived, and that's an aorist, by the way, only once, not over and over and over again, you know, as a, as a repetitive sequence, the word is an aorist. It's a once only thing. Sin revived once. I died once. There's another aorist in this particular context. Therefore, the commandment that was ordained to life, and it was, it was, if, if you could fulfill the law, which we know is impossible, but if you, if you could have done that, uh, it's a straw man that doesn't exist. There's not one single one that doeth good and sinneth not. Not, not a single one. Not one. But the commandment was ordained to life. It, it was a good thing. There, there isn't anything bad about God's law. The text is not presenting to us any idea at all that God's law is, is the problem here. I mean, is there something wrong with, with not lying? Is there something wrong with not bearing false witness? Is there something wrong with, with not murdering somebody? I mean, you know, these are good things. But... Paul says, I found it unto death. Hadn't been the law, he wouldn't have died. The strength of sin is the law. We know that from Corinthians. For sin taking occasion, okay, it was sin now that took the occasion by means of the commandment deceived me and by means of the commandment, it slew me. That's the strength of sin is the law. The one thing we can't argue with is that the strength of sin is the law. By the commandment, it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy and the commandment is holy, just, and good. The commandment is holy, just, and good. Now, these are strong words. The word Good, in the text there, is the Greek word agathos, uh, means a beautiful thing. It's good in every aspect of, of its construction. Was then that which is good made death unto me? No, it isn't the law, not at all. But the sin, and that's articulated, that it might really appear sin, be made absolutely manifest. And, and that's an aorist passive, working death in me by that which is good, that the sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. Exceeding sinful. That's why God gave the law. That's why he gave the law. Now, I'm, I'm speaking to the entire world religious system when I say this. This statement, it's got me in trouble many times, but I have to keep repeating it. God did not give the law for anybody to keep it. He didn't give, that's, that wasn't his purpose. He didn't give the law for Israel's redemption. You know, it, it amazes me even to this day how many Christians I talk to you know, that feel like that the purpose of the law in the Old Testament was to redeem Israel. It wasn't. It was to make sin exceeding sinful. It was to reveal the holiness and the righteousness of our God and not only reveal that holiness and righteousness, 
but to reveal man's absolute inability to meet its righteous requirements, it's to meet its demands, its righteous standard. Can't be done. It simply can't be done. The law would drive them to Christ. It was not the purpose of the law to redeem Israel. It wasn't the purpose of the law to give them a, uh, you know, a book of instructions on how to live the Christian life, give them a manner of life, a guidebook, kind of a, like a Boy Scout manual on, on how to you know, live. It was the purpose of the law to make sin exceeding sinful and reveal the absolute righteousness and holiness and justice of God. That was the law's purpose. It still does that in our lives today. It drives us, drives us to Christ. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, says Paul, sold under sin. Sold under sin. The word spiritual there is, is uh, in the Greek, is pneumatikos. Pneumatikos. And the word carnal, the word for carnal is sarkinos. And for those of you who are skilled in Greek, you know, I know there's got to be people out there that know more about the Greek construction than I do, that the ending of those words has actually has significance. If the word ends in kappa omicron sigma, kos, it means quality, character. If it ends in nos, it means substance. For we know that the law is spiritual, and that's pneumatikos, and the quality of the law is spiritual. It is the substance. It's not the substance of the law that, that's spiritual. It's the quality and the intent of the law that's, that's spiritual. But I am carnal, and that's nos. Carnal is nos. That's sarkin, sarkinos. And that word means that my substance is flesh. I am carnal. That's my substance. Having been sold, that, this is a perfect passive participle. Paul, as, as the subject, had nothing to do with it. Having been sold in past time, under the authority of, of the sin, the sin, the old man, the sin nature as some call it, we know that the qual the, the the quality of the law is spiritual, but the substance of me is carnal. Flesh having been sold. And, and that's a complete perfect tense, completely done in past time. Under the dominion of the old man, the sin nature. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that, which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good, good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Now we got to back up. We, gotta, we know the quality of the law. Is spiritual. We know that the substance is flesh having been sold under sin. And that is the present condition of every single one of you and me. I completely disagree with those who've taken uh, this uh, chapter, Romans 7, this, this text, to, to indicate that this was Paul's conflict 
before he realized the perfect victory he had in Christ. You know, and then we suddenly, you know, we go into the eighth chapter and we see, you know, well, Romans 8 is all about victory. Struggle in 7, victory in 8. I believe this conflict is valid and rigorous and violent in every one of you. I absolutely do. We have, we've had the victory since chapter 3. And, and if you haven't recognized this conflict yet, yet, you will. I mean, it'll get worse, actually, the older you get. And I believe that this verse has been taken by many people, you know, as an escape clause. You know, to say that they have no responsibility, no Christian responsibility before God. You know, how can I be responsible? What I want to do, I don't do. I do the very thing I don't want to do. You know, that you have absolutely none, no responsibility. Now, I don't believe that you have any to become a child of God. You not only have no responsibility to become God's child, you have no ability to become a child of God. But we're not talking about that here. You, you know me, that I believe that you don't become a child of God because you're born by your own will. You're born by the will of God, John 1.13. You're one of his sheep because you were born as one of his sheep. You're wheat because you were planted as wheat. Tear doesn't become wheat. Goats don't become sheep. I mean, that's a finished transaction. New birth by God from above. The scriptures declare you were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Doesn't mean you were chosen, well, you know, if you choose yourself. You're chosen if you believe. You know, you could be one of the chosen if you just want to be chosen bad enough. But if you don't want to be, then, well, if you don't want to be chosen, then you're not one of the chosen. All of that is Arminian ridiculousnessism. You are God's because he planted you. You always were his. You were always his. There never was a time, never was there a time that you were not God's. There was a time when you were dead in sin, but you were always God's. Paul would have been in heaven if he had died at the age of two. The road to Damascus was not a a, a, an experience where he became a child, God's child, where he became God's child. He didn't become a child of God on the road to Damascus. The Damascus experience had everything to do with Paul realizing that he was a child of God, that he was God's child. He wasn't a goat before that. At which time he suddenly realized, he suddenly realized that he had responsibilities he never had before to live as a child of God. I don't believe that you should take the 15th verse to say, well, well, you know, I have no Christian responsibility. I can't help what I do. Can't do what I want to do. Don't, don't, don't assume that position. The question becomes just where do the Christian's responsibilities reside? That's the question. It's not that we're not responsible. We are. It's just in what way are we responsible? That we've died to the law, that we've died to sin in, in order that we might bear fruit unto God, taking our position as those who have been crucified with Christ and risen with Christ, even ascended and co-seated with Christ in the heavenlies, who are dead to sin but alive unto God, is that not very much a part of Christian responsibility? Is knowing that we stand before God without spot, without condemnation, is that a part of Christian responsibility? Is, or is our responsibility based on that those truths? Is our agreeing with God that the flesh profits nothing? Is that a part of Christian responsibility? Does Christian responsibility ride on the shoulders of that truth? I think we need to be very careful when we speak 
of Christian responsibility because in the minds of most Christians today, Christian responsibility is disguised in the weary, worn-out costume of, of law-keeping as a rule of life. What makes this so unfruitful is that it presents our God as someone other than who he is. It presents our God as someone who hasn't done what he said he's done. And, and it presents this book to say something other than what it says. Folks, show me in this chapter, show me, any emphasis on our performance. Where is there any mention of, of our accomplishments? Any exaltation of self? Any praise of self? or any mention of consequences resulting from our failure to accomplish any righteous standard. Show me that. I don't believe you'll find it. Just who is being exalted in this chapter? None other than the one who's being exalted throughout this whole book. Is it us or is it Christ? Who is at the forefront? Jesus Christ. Who is being emphasized? Jesus Christ. Our responsibility is clearly being presented here. Make no mistake about it, but it, it is one that stands upon the shoulders of Christ's work on our behalf. The truths which God has so graciously infused into our lives up to this point in this epistle to the Romans it is an old covenant, but an entirely new covenant. It's not the gospel of the kingdom, which Israel rejected. That's not what's being presented to us here, but the gospel of Christ. Our relationship with Christ, our walk with Christ, who is the fulfillment, who embodies the law, who is the fulfillment of the law. Grace, not law. The beauty of his life, not our own. There's no beauty here in us. It says we have been loosed from the law of our former husband, law, joined to another who was raised from the dead. Pretty sure that implies he's alive. Therefore, since he is alive, since Christ is risen from the dead, why do Christians live alive unto that former husband as though Christ is still dead. How could we not see that he desires to be our life? Not, not someone who just lived and some historical figure who just lived and died and, and left, leaving us a, an impossible example to follow trying to do what only he could do and did do. The very fact that this conflict exists when God could have eradicated the old man, done away with it, you know, where we'd be a whole bunch of Jesuses running around, was purposed and allowed by God so that we would depend on him and not ourselves, that our confidence would be in him not the flesh. The chapter ends with God assuring us we have the victory in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you again for the time that you've just given us to feast upon your word. I ask that you would strip away any foolishness or ignorance, but seal to our hearts only that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.